All right. Well, we have hit the top of the hour, so let's get started today. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the Illinois EPA Office of Energy Public Water Infrastructure Energy Efficiency Programs webinar series. This is the second webinar in our fall series, um, and we hope you join us for many more. <clears throat> As you're already doing already, please take a moment to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're coming from today. Whew, I drank some water right before I talked and it's caught in my throat. I apologize. <laughs> Let's continue. My name is Cassie Carroll and I'm the program manager here at CDAC. I also work with CDAC's technical director, Sean Maurer, to deliver this program to you all this morning. Ooh, Sean, you might have to take over. <laughs> uh, so who we are here at CDAC, we're an applied research program here at the University of Illinois. Uh, our overall goal is to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. Uh, the public water infrastructure program is one of the many programs that we offer to achieve that mission. Uh, we partner for the public water infrastructure program with the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. We kind of split 50-50 uh, between uh, uh, energy assessments for the program. So they'll do 20 of the assessments for the program year. We'll do the other 20. Uh, ISTC's mission is very similar to ours, uh, encouraging and assisting citizens, businesses, and government in preventing pollution to conserve natural resources and to reduce waste to protect human health and the environment in Illinois and beyond. Are you doing better, Cassie? I am. I have recovered, I promise. Thanks for uh, folks' concerns in the chat, too. <laughs> Um, before we keep going here, um, I'll tell you a little bit of how the program works, um, but just a couple uh, Zoom housekeeping things to uh, continue to use the chat throughout the day. I'll monitor uh, questions as we go. Feel free to use that chat box or the Q&A box in the presentation. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Also, uh, CEUs and participation certificates will be available tomorrow morning, along with the recording of this session and slides. So you can share the recording and slides around with those who weren't able to make it today, but you will get your CEU course number and certificates tomorrow. Um, so we're really excited today uh, to talk about a little bit about how this program works. So if you haven't gotten an assessment with us, which I see many folks in our chat today have, uh, but if you haven't, um, it might be a good idea to check it out and see what opportunities you have to reduce energy use and costs at your water or wastewater facilities. We do serve both, even though our session today is focused on wastewater systems. So the assessments are no cost, um, and uh, that includes the assessment itself, the report that we deliver, and technical assistance and implementation support afterwards. So we really try to help uh, facilities implement the measures that we recommend. So that report after you get the assessment done, which the uh, it's really easy to get started in the program. Usually, if you haven't heard from me yet, you will. Um, and uh, we'll try to get you involved in an assessment. The first step is collecting some basic data um, and utility information about your plant. And that's the most work that you have to do in the program. We'll then come out and set a site assessment with you. Um, site assessments can last anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on how big your facility is. And then we'll go back and create a report. So it's a comprehensive report and we list uh, cost of upgrades, estimated payback period, and any applicable incentives of funding opportunities that um, are associated with the measures that we recommend. Um, after your assessment report is complete, then we'll provide some support to help you uh, navigate those projects we recommended. So um, feel free uh, to get an assessment. I think it's a good idea both for newer facilities. So seeing, checking in, seeing how things are running, are they still running efficiently or as designed to be um, operated? Or um, even if you have an existing plant, there's ways that we can look at and support your new equipment upgrades that you're looking to investigate or uh, even just operational low cost, no cost opportunities. Um, so part of the program, we also uh, host continuing education events. And then um, there may be grant funding coming out soon from Illinois EPA. We'll keep you posted on that, but you can definitely take advantage of a lot of different funding opportunities as well. So uh, let us know if you're interested in the program. I will put the link to our application in the chat if you feel uh, excited about getting an assessment and would like to explore different energy efficiency, resource recovery, or other opportunities for your plant and its operations. So 
Today, our plant will, or our event will focus on resource recovery for wastewater treatment systems. So in this webinar, we'll present a variety of different options for wastewater resource recovery that may provide additional opportunities actually for revenue generation. So we'll discuss a lot of different new technologies and emerging technologies. Uh, and I am excited to turn it over to Sean, our technical director, uh, to introduce our speakers for the day and more about what we'll gain out of today's session. Uh, thanks so much for your patience with my uh, <laughs> with my inability to speak for a hot moment. And Sean, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Cassie. Uh, so as Cassie mentioned, I am the technical director here at the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. Uh, joining me today is uh, Ganesh Wargood. Uh, he's a professor of energy environment um, at uh, Purdue Northwestern University uh, and directs their water institute there. So he's got a lot of background uh, looking at some of the topics that we're talking about today as far as resource recovery and research and, and wastewater technologies. Uh, so I'll kind of kick things off here. I want to talk a little bit about the technologies that are available out there. Uh, there are a lot more than I realized when I started digging in for this presentation. Um, I tried to focus on one's uh, technologies that have uh, either pilot plants that are ready for application on sites and stuff that are, you know, they're commercially available and aren't necessarily ones that are only in the research and development phase, um, because there are a lot of uh, research and development opportunities as well for resource recovery. Uh, so today we're going to talk about what about what is resource recovery? What does that mean for our modern plants today? Uh, we're going to describe what the recoverable resources are in our wastewater streams and determine how to convert those streams into income streams. Is, is there a potential marketability for some of these waste streams where you can generate some added revenue for your plant and help um, not only fund um, the technologies and the energy needed to do some of these conversions from waste to resources, um, but also just to make your plants more profitable and sustainable. And then we'll kind of just summarize some of the available recovery technologies that we found that are available on the market today. Uh, so first off, what is resource recovery? Um, early on, wastewater treatment plants were just designed to treat the wastewater, clean it up, deposit that water back into the environment so it has minimal impact on the environment. And everything that we pulled out of that wastewater was waste. It was landfilled. It was thrown away. Um, we didn't try to recover much material from it. Um, and that's just not a very sustainable model anymore. Um, so a lot of times now, plants are trying to rebrand themselves as resource recovery facilities. We're trying to take some of these waste streams and turn them into resources that we can reuse in a more circular economy. Uh, so what resources are available in our wastewater streams that we can recover? Uh, a lot of people are already familiar with CHP systems, where if you have an anaerobic digester, uh, you get biogas out of that, methane, CO2, um, and you can burn that in a CHP system. You generate some energy for yourself as far as electricity. Um, you can recover that heat, use it to heat the digester, so you minimize the energy impacts of that system. Um, but the wastewater itself also contains a significant amount of thermal energy. Uh, if you think about, you know, people are taking showers and washing their hands, that uses hot water. That hot water gets dumped down the drain, so that sewer water is generally warmer than natural water would be. Um, it's also coming out of the ground, so groundwater temperatures play an impact as well. Uh, you can treat that wastewater stream essentially as a water source for a heat pump system. Um, nutrients are a big thing. It's a major concern, especially here in the Mississippi River Basin, where we're trying to deal with uh, impacts to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so trying to filter out nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, phosphorus in particular being a limited resource. Uh, we want to make sure we're recovering and reusing that material as much as possible. Um, biosolids for land applications, probably the most common resource recovery that we do right now for uh, wastewater treatment facilities is we dry our sludge, make sure that it's safe to deposit on land, doesn't have pathogens and, and chemicals in it that are detrimental. And then we apply that to agricultural fields and land applications. Um, but then there's also a lot of other waste streams that are typically, at this point, just deposited. Um, so people that have anaerobic digesters have probably dealt with struvite deposits in piping and networks. It's a maintenance hassle that can be turned into uh, a potential uh, side stream uh, economic benefit. You, know, you can turn that into fertilizer and, and sell that. Um, Biosolids themselves um, 
trucking off biosolids to a landfill or to agricultural sites um, can be a cost to a wastewater treatment plant. Those materials can be turned into either lighter weight biosolids by drying them out further, uh, or you can turn them into synthetic gas, bio oil, other marketable materials. Um, and then also one means of nutrient recovery is through uh, algal treatment of uh, wastewater streams. And that algae itself can be turned into various different marketable materials, such as fertilizer, animal feed, um, lots of other uh, opportunities there. Um, so kind of kick things off on kind of the simpler end, uh, energy recovery that a lot of people, uh, we've already seen these implemented in Illinois wastewater treatment plants. CHP systems are, are fairly common uh, for plants that have large enough capacity where that becomes a, a marketable option for them. Um, so you get electric generation uh, off the biogas as you burn it um, and you recover the heat from that uh, engine and use it to heat your digester that you're processing to get the biogas. Um, here's an overall market study, uh, market potential study by the uh, Water Resource Recovery Foundation uh, that indicates that CHP has the potential to supply up to 5% of the heating energy um, nationally that the nation needs and 1% of the electric energy needed. Um, when you're looking at individual wastewater treatment plants, it can bring you to net zero energy. Um, but the other resource that's contained, as I mentioned earlier, is the temperature in that wastewater. You can attach a water source heat pump system generally to the effluent stream of that wastewater um, where you've already cleaned out solids and stuff. So you're not going to worry about gunking up a heat exchange or anything like that. Um, and from that effluent stream, you can then extract heat in the wintertime. You can deposit heat in the summertime. Um, that amount of heat energy contained can provide up to 46% of the heating energy needs um, for communities if you had a district heating system. Um, and one example of that is actually uh, built out in uh, the National Western Center in Denver, Colorado. Uh, they're calling it their sewer thermal system. Uh, they've got a seven building campus out there and the heating plant is rated at about 3.8 megawatts of heating and cooling energy capacity. Um, so even though this isn't particularly usage at a wastewater facility, um, there's a potential here, especially as a lot of us are working on uh, upgrades to our collection systems and uh, relining pipes and things like that. Um, you might be able to partner with a campus entity like a hospital, a university campus, someone like that, uh, to build a heat recovery system as part of your collection network um, and make use of that thermal energy. And that partnership can help fund um, not only the operation of the heat recovery facility, but also um, improvements to the collection system overall. Um, renewable natural gas uh, is one that's not considered very often. A lot of people look at CHP and forget that you can do other things with that biogas. Um, so renewable natural gas is looking at taking that uh, biogas, which has CO2, other trace gas uh, components in it, and methane, and cleaning it to near 100% methane content. Um, so it can be injected into the natural gas pipeline and used as a renewable um, natural gas resource. Uh, NICOR Gas actually has a pilot program running right now uh, where they will help fund the interconnection of your facility to their natural gas pipeline. So they'll, they'll help fund the cleaning skid, the materials for that, um, the interconnection to the pipeline and all the, the controls needed for that. Um, so there's a good opportunity there for people up in NICOR Gas territory. Um, I haven't seen a similar program for Ameren yet, but if there's enough demand for it, they might consider it. Um, and sometimes cleaning and dumping that um, natural gas to a pipeline, or maybe you don't have to clean it as much. You've got a nearby commercial client, an industrial facility that burns natural gas. Um, maybe they can tolerate a little bit dirtier gas product, um, has a little bit of not quite 100% methane content to it. Um, you can sell that biogas directly to them at a rate that's cheaper than if they were purchasing pure natural gas. Um, and so that would benefit both you and the industry as a commercial resource for your facility and a cheaper source of natural gas um, for that industry. Um, so there's ways um, where, depending on your location and what businesses are nearby your facility, um, there might be an alternative use. Or if CHP you determined wasn't cost effective for you, 
maybe um, converting to renewable natural gas might be an option. Uh, water recovery itself. Uh, we've been to a number of plants that um, they've got a, a UV treatment stream. Sometimes they bypass that stream and they use that water for irrigation purposes. A nearby golf course um, has been a, a very common one that we've seen for some uh, wastewater treatment facilities. Um, but they charge a small fee to run the pumps and discharge that water onto the field. It's cheaper than using potable water for that client. So it's a benefit to both entities as a resource stream for the wastewater facility and a low cost water source for people that need irrigation. Uh, other opportunities are sometimes the water can be used for cooling towers, uh, particularly if you've got industry that has a heavy cooling component to it. Um, you could potentially pipe and sell water to uh, local nearby industry instead of just discharging that water to uh, a local stream or wetland. Um, as you can see in this the, the picture here, uh, the stream is coming down from the top of the screen uh, and coming in from the left side of that image is the effluent from the plant. It's actually cleaner than what was in that stream. Um, so if you can make use of that water as a resource, um, particularly out west, one of the things we're seeing is full recycle of water. Um, they're either using that water, sending it to breweries, and then they're using that water to brew beers and wines, things like that. Um, and there are also full recycle plants where the wastewater treatment plant is partnered with a water treatment plant. They're cleaning that water to potable quality and recycling it back into the community. Uh, some alternatives to um, combined heat and power systems. Um, when we're looking at sludge recovery, one of the issues with uh, land application of sludge is there are contaminants that are left in that sludge, heavy metals, PFAS, pharmaceuticals. Um, not all of that is heavily monitored right now, but that's coming in the future. Um, and so as we have more and more stringent regulations coming for what we can do with our biosolids, we're gonna have to start thinking about better and better ways to treat those biosolids before we deposit them. Uh, one of the technologies, there's a number of companies that provide um, is uh, called pyrolysis, where you're taking that sludge, you're heating it up in a uh, oxygen-free environment, essentially, um, and turning that sludge into uh, both bio oils, biochar, and some combustible gases. Um, usually the gases are recycled back in the system to help reduce the energy impact uh, for doing pyrolysis, um, but the biochar and bio oil can both be marketed and sold by the facility as an income stream. Um, and the nice thing about this is it eliminates PFAS, it eliminates microplastics and pharmaceuticals. Uh, heavy metals are generally captured in the ash and are converted to an oxidized stable state. Um, I know one of the big concerns with incineration, there are plants that do incineration for sludge, is that those heavy metals are volatilized and they leave in the exhaust airstream. Um, pyrolysis can help capture and reduce how much of those heavy metals are escaping in the air. Um, and another similar process is gasification. Um, so high pressure and temperature with an oxidizer in it. Um, and you're converting, instead of getting bio oil and biochar and multiple outputs of the process, you're just getting synthesis gas. Uh, so carbon monoxide, hydrogen, methane products. Um, that gas can be used to burn on site to run the process. Um, the ash waste is a byproduct of that. And again, that ash can be used uh, will can be used as a, a land application, um, and again, you've eliminated PFAS, microplastics, pharmaceuticals, other uh, materials and hazards that are in there. Um, concentrated heavy metals in that ash can then be disposed of as hazardous waste. Um, looking at nutrient recovery options. Um, we mentioned gasification and pyrolysis, things like that, where you can take your sludge and turn it into a, a marketable product, fertilizers, bio oils, things like that. Um, for plants that are looking at resource recovery now uh, for uh, nitrogen and phosphorus recovery, um, a lot of plants are doing this with biological treatment. They're doing additional treatment basins and controlled aeration um, in order to biologically remove phosphorus um, and nitrogen. Usually the phosphorus is contained in the biosolids uh, that exit the plant. Um, but another option um, that can help recover that uh, those nutrients is um, algal treatment. Um, 
And so you're capturing carbon in this material. Um, you're also uh, capturing phosphorus and nitrogen in these materials, and it can be scraped off of these membranes. Uh, there's a couple different companies uh, that we've actually seen implementing these processes. Uh, I know MWRD has done a, a test study uh, with one of these algal programs, um, but you can scrape the algae off of these in a harvestable manner. Um, and then that algae can be dried into pellets, turned into fertilizer, can be a supplement to animal feed. Um, there's a couple different options for that. You can turn it into bio oil. Um, so that algae can be a side stream product that can be sold and help fund um, the addition of these uh, facilities to your site. Um, and the nice thing about algae is you, you're pretty much just building a greenhouse on the site. And then you've got some kind of um, material that that algae can grow on that you're going to harvest it off of. Um, it's a little bit um, more compact than traditional algal sites, which used large shallow ponds um, that took up a lot of land area. Uh, the nice thing about these technologies is they make them more compact so they can fit on a smaller site. Um, other technologies that address uh, PFAS, again, that's coming down the line. There will be regulations uh, more and more on addressing forever chemicals, pharmaceuticals, uh, other emerging contaminants, microplastics, things like that. Um, one technology I've run across and actually has some marketable um, uh, products right now is supercritical water oxidation. So they're taking water and they're heating it up to high temperature and pressure. Um, getting that water into a super critical state, which changes the properties of that water, uh, where then heavy metals are separated out into salts, uh, PFAS, pharmaceuticals, things like that. They all break down under that into um, CO2 gas, water molecules, um, and salts. Um, part of this process, it does create some acids as you're breaking chlorine, sulfides, things like that off of these PFAS chemicals. Uh, so some chemical addition does have to happen in these to maintain the acidity um, so that you have a, a neutral uh, water stream coming out of this process. Um, but the salts that come out as a byproduct can be converted into useful um, uh, fertilizers or other uh, minerals. Um, and so there is a bit of marketing potential there for some of the waste stream that comes out of this process. And it can be with proper heat recovery, um, since this is a high temperature process, um, since it's high pressure, you can run through a turbine and generate electricity off of this to get the water back down to uh, atmospheric pressure and temperature. Um, once this process is up and running, it can be self-sustaining. Um, and that's kind of the marketing ploy for this 374 water that I've run across. Uh, they were at WefTech um, a few months ago. Uh, I saw their talk about their product up at the Smart Water Utilities Conference. Um, there are a couple other companies that have similar products. Uh, what I have seen for a lot of uh, supercritical water systems is that they tend to apply to industrial scales more so. This is the first company I've seen where they've got um, a product that works at wastewater treatment plants and smaller facilities, and they're working on scaling it up to larger facilities. Uh, so that's kind of the technology overview that I've run across. There are a lot of other technologies that are available in research and development phases. Um, but I will turn it over to Ganeswar to talk about some additional details. Okay. Let me see um, if I can share my screen. Yeah, I should be able to. So it says host disabled. Um, Okay, you should be able to share now. So then, thank you. Can you see my screen? Just loaded, yep. All right. Okay, so um, our topics just align because we have a common theme for this uh, session today. So oh, uh, thank you for the great presentation, Sean. Uh, you really set the stage for this talk. So um, I don't have to go through a lot of details here then. Um, as you will see, uh, my title is about uh, resource recovery for circular water management. Um, if you will see um, in the industry or in, in across all industries, you will see the new world buzzing around circular economy. 
So circular economy is one thing, every industry, um, respective of what they do, they're looking into uh, ways to keep things in the loop uh, before they discard them out into the environment and that would cause environmental impact. So we would like to keep things in the planetary boundaries as long as possible so that resource uh, consumption is minimized. That is the uh, basic theme behind uh, circular economy and that fits the concept or um, fits very well for what we do in wastewater treatment plants. As you see on the screen here, there are many opportunities for us to be able to re recover and reuse and recycle those valuable products that are available in wastewater. So I might, I will have, uh, I will start with my acknowledgements. So I also have an appointment with Purdue University and um, um, I like to acknowledge all my funding agencies before and my students and collaborators. Um, so what we're going to cover today is, as obviously we know that uh, wastewater industry thinking is changing dramatically, and, and we know that, and we are experiencing it, and we are moving forward uh, in a much positive direction. Um, and we're also looking into ways to make this process more profitable, more enjoyable, rather than um, as it is described in the webinar description, in, in a, it's not a burden, but we want to see there's opportunities to make it better. And we also look into resource recovery and reuse solutions. What, what, those, what are those things that are available to us in wastewater? And we'll look at some of the processes. Um, I'd like to just highlight a few challenges um, where we see there is promise for, you know, such as anaerobic digestion and CHP combinations. Um, and then we'll conclude with just two statements uh, that should take care of a lot of things that we do. So in the past, we were thinking about, we looked at lots of us despised waste or never cared for it, right? All we cared about is remove, remove and get rid of it. But we look at it right now as a resource and we are looking for ways to recover and reuse, uh, whether it be energy, um, nutrients, valuable byproducts or water itself. So we're looking at um, environmental pollution to environmental flows. The, the slide that um, Sean showed you before, uh, it, it's possibly that they're trying to augment the environmental flows in that stream uh, with that high quality uh, effluent that's going in there. It's quite common in um, um, the Southwest and Western part of the country, uh, our country here. So what do we have in wastewater that we should be so um, excited about, right? There is a lot of energy in it. So we know that there is carbon carbon present in the organic wastes and there are nutrients that each individual is contributing every single day. Um, and of course, the water itself is the major invaluable resource that we need and without which we cannot even imagine a sustainable development um, in our diet. So just to give an example here, um, and on the left side, you see that the circular economy potential on the top, and then you see the negative uh, side of the uh, bar would be uh, the current practice uh, where if we neglect to remove or neglect to recover nitrogen and phosphorus or, or carbon um, from wastewater, but if we uh, recover, then the potential benefits that could be re recognized uh, or realized in the form of energy um, are shown in there. Just to show that there's so many kilowatt hours of energy can be saved if only we can um, recover one kilogram of one of these uh, valuable nutrients. And also you'll see that um, the chart on the um, right side, you see it shows the potential value associated with each of these resources. And, uh, um, and also you'll note that water itself is a major um, resource there that has maximum value in there. Well, so towards circular economy. So what are we achieving? What are we trying to do here? It's it's beyond, it's actually just not beyond 
achieving economic benefits. We're talking about health. We're talking about communities. We're talking about resiliency. We're talking about environmental impact and sustainability um, and our ecosystems. So uh, often we just get entangled or when we look at it, you know, we see that cost as a major uh, challenge. And when we try to do something new, um, but in this case, where we try to deal with our uh, uh, wastewater management systems um, across the scale, small to large scale systems, uh, finances are only one aspect of it when we have to look into uh, these beneficial aspects of the processes. Uh, because I, I, I try to differentiate between finances versus you know economics. As you see, economical analysis would be more comprehensive and holistic. It would look into the benefits that we would get in to get out of it. So as an investor, somebody would be only concerned about what is it costing me to do something and what am I profiting out of it? So the profit is a real concern for them. Well, that has to be a concern, but if we look at it in a holistic way, uh, every effort, all, every investment would make much more sense when we consider the environmental and social benefits that we get or sustainability benefits that we can achieve through those investments. Uh, that, that is the whole concept of the circular economy as well. And you will see that there's, there's more than what we think of when we talk about circular economy in the context of wastewater treatment systems. Well, I apologize. I think many of you might be finding it difficult when I said wastewater treatment systems, so we should be calling water resource recovery facilities, right? I'm excited about that. Um, so, well, so the value proposition is very important, right? So how do we sell this, what we have to somebody else, and how do we get um, uh, people excited about what we have, what we do uh, in, in the field? So uh, as you already know, many of you are you know, you're, you're experts, in, or all of you, so you know everything that we're talking here. Um, as you see here, this is like a ladder, we're going up. So costs are going up. And then um, as, as a result of the value of the product that we get out of the process or the management solution that we have should be higher. And it also has to be serving a higher purpose, better purpose. So as you'll see, I, I'm, I hope we can read this, what we have on the screen. Um, up in the ladder, you'll see that it's industrial application. So when we are, like Sean mentioned, um, when we come, you know, uh, uh, partner with other industries that can benefit from the products that are coming out of the treatment plants, that turns out to be a more uh, profitable endeavor. And so that's a, a lot of good examples have been shared already. But what we see here is that uh, depending on the application, where we want to put the water, um, th this is in the context of water. Okay, so we're talking about uh, even some uh, some of these look at energy recovery from and carbon credits, but if the portable water is supposed to give us the highest value in terms of water, but of course, we would also have energy and other byproducts that can be recovered. Now, if you look at the global scenario, we see a lot of applications in agriculture because you this is for treated and recorded. So what is reported in a way, but there may be a lot of applications going on without being reported or being monitored. So you'll see that agriculture and industry are the major beneficiaries of the effluents coming out of uh, uh, water recreation facilities that we're talking about. And uh, of course, recreation, some landscaping that would be happening at domestic levels and community levels um, and so on. Now, it is obvious that we have to go much more in, in terms of treatment levels. So we categorize it at advanced treatment levels, right? So if, depending on the application, if you're going to near portable uses, we definitely have to be looking at uh, much more advanced and costlier processes, uh, which are outlined in the far right column, activated carbon, reverse osmosis. Thankfully, activated carbon is not that expensive, uh, but membrane process advanced filtration processes can be costly. And indirect portable uses can be, um, don't tend to be that expensive when it comes to water use. So I outline here water recovery technologies. Uh, as you see, um, there are a bunch of technologies that we can talk about. Um, the filtration, among filtration, we have conventional and membrane filtration, and then disinfection and advanced oxygen processes based on what we have to deal with. 
Um, and so you note that there are some of these boxes that are shaded that that's to represent that they're more commonly applied as you can recognize from this. Uh, you will see that micro filtration and auto filtration are more commonly used. Well, we would only use reverse osmosis if the, if the end use is, um, is justified, right? Uh, of course, sand filtration is commonly used, and we also see granular activated carbon. I see a question about uh, uh, granular activated carbon. I'd be happy to address that. Um, and also chlorination and UV radiation. Um, as uh, Sean mentioned, UV radiation is used in applications where you know you don't want to disturb um, the, the receiving water bodies, uh, water quality or microbi microbiome in a, in a way. So. Yeah, and and the, we have these options, several options. Um, and when it comes to irrigation, just to look at this water reuse um, as a, in a scenario in the United States, we have planned way of using this uh, treated wastewater in, in, in many of our states, especially Southwest and Western states where agriculture is predominant. Whereas you also see that what is alarming is across the global levels, the red spaces where they actually use untreated wastewater uh, directly or indirectly. So I, what it's demonstrating is water is considered so uh, of high value that they're willing to just reuse it. Of course, in some of these communities that they're not able to afford treatment that is required for those, some of those. So that means we all have this challenge, right? Moving forward, trying to come up with um, affordable technologies for, uh, so before we move a little bit further into, you know, talking about what, what we have, and what we're going to recover from nitrogen, from wastewater. So let's look at, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, those quantities that are available in uh, wastewater so of different strands. Um, so you, you may be familiar with, with these numbers because we see them, but the, but the table below shows the uh, you know, global level um, quantities per year that are available. And I also had another chart, but I didn't want to just uh, put a lot of data in there. Um, so that that's the so with that background because we need to look at the carbon here how much carbon we can we're actually dis, discarding at minimum what you see is this is two hundred ninety uh, total organic carbon it is kind of more of a conservative number actually it can be much higher than that so I, I want you to recognize that. Now, energy recovery technologies, again, we have the same framework here. We could make biofuels out of it if we use algae or algal based treatment methods. And we also look into recovering biogas, right? That's the most famous uh, option we have today. And of course, there is electricity and heat coming out of combined heat and power applications. Again, the uh, boxes that are in gray, they show the uh, more commonly, uh, most commonly used applications in our utilities around the world. Uh, so there is uh, sludge core digestion is um, gaining traction and then combined power definitely many of the um, um, and that federal agencies are behind it because it is it's believed that it is to contribute to environmental sustainability and energy sustainability across the border. Um, so now here I wanted to discuss with you um, just as a case um, to look into this aspect of in the United States we have about uh, 235 um, utilities. Or there could be much more right now. It is slightly old data. Um, this chart on your left side uh, demonstrates that, or to uh, show indicate that, um, uh, that if you follow uh, the natural gas price that's um, uh, shown on the uh, left y-axis, uh, sorry, right side of secondary y-axis, and then you also have the installations, number of installations. Um, Note that. Um, you know, uh, the number of installations tend to follow the gas price. So people see that the, the gas price is increasing, natural gas price, and so there is more demand for these. So I think these kind of trends we have seen uh, in our lives. For example, when gas prices went up in 2008, uh, there was a lot of demand for Prius, Toyota Prius, because it was given lots of mileage and so on. And then, then gas price comes up and the market goes down and, and so on. Same thing happens with CHP, but there is continued uh, market for that because the benefits are, are clear. Now, when it comes to um, 
CHP units, there are different types that we can consider depending on the, um, the size and you know the application. And so this shows the uh, chart that uh, the distribution of these. Um, what I wanted to show here is though, uh, this is the case for uh, Southwestern uh, um, state, uh, one of the what utilities um, that's treating about 10 million gallons per day of water. And then uh, you see that right table that is ha that has the all of the assumptions parameters considered. The bottom line here is our takeaway point is that we have to make use of both heat and electricity to the maximum level to be able to profit from combined heat and power system configuration. As you will see, the tipping point there at the 70% of the thermal demand um, uh, su supplied by CHP has to be used to be able to um, be more profitable or to reduce the uh, you know the per unit price of the um, energy produced through the system. So beyond that, uh, because we would be using our standby boilers and others and then natural gas will kick in. So uh, there is not further benefits. Benefits don't really justify uh, the, the the investment that has to go in. So it, it's, it's a nice demonstration here to show that uh, the curve actually just plateaus at some point. Uh, but the point is we need to find appropriate application or partnership where both heat and electricity can be, of course, electricity everybody wants, right? Uh, but heat is something can be, uh, when in Northern uh, regions, uh, heat is not an issue to be used up in the server. Of course, um, as Sean mentioned, you can use it on site itself. You know, you don't have to um, sell it to someone just to uh, realize benefits. Here, I see one challenge with, um, um, but, um, dealing with biogas is that we have emissions coming in. Uh, and so if uh, there can be about 10 to 20% of emissions anywhere happening, you will see different uh, types of um, um, greenhouse gases being emitted across the stages of wastewater treatment process here. Um, and they're given in uh, you know, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide in different stages. So if being aware of you know, awareness and then maybe finding ways to uh, reduce the loss of methane. Uh, well, I'm talking about uh, emissions here, but then uh, here you see in this chart, uh, where the uh, methane specifically is being released, uh, obviously we would expect that to happen in the anaerobic digestion unit itself through leaks and so on. Uh, that is actually, uh, you know, the max, the majority of it happening there. So there is an opportunity to be more productive and more efficient. Um, to it come to if we if we can come up with a, a proper man, monitoring and um, uh, design. Here it shows co-digestion versus uh, regular anaerobic digestion, conventional digestion plants. And the, it's talking about digestion management, the blue bar is showing, and the other one is miscellaneous you know, pipelines and so on, um, where losses are occurring. So it's, it's good to know that as well. Um, this shows methane loss for the amount of methane produced. So the more we're producing, um, the amount of losses that appear to be, so at small scale, losses seem to be higher. Um, and that needs to be, these are measured values from um, across utilities and, and, and in European countries. That, that is one thing I want to discuss about. So there is an opportunity, but there is also a challenge. So we need to find ways to make it more efficient in terms of energy recovery. So nutrient recovery technologies, um, uh, of course, there are plenty of technologies that we can think about, um, um, especially when it comes to nitrogen phosphorus. I will share some some of them very briefly, but I don't intend to go in detail. But to show here that the two of these true white is, you know, we all are very familiar with that. Um, and there are a number of processes that do this, uh, um, produce true white, and then sludge land application is, is uh, majorly used. Now, what is going to be a smart way of dealing with either nitrogen, phosphorus, or for that matter, carbon? A year ago, uh, exactly, I presented uh, in another um, uh, session, I didn't want to reuse the material. So 
there we talked about how to capture carbon to the maximum level so that we increase energy recovery. The same thing here, we talk about nitrogen recovery by up concentrations. So if you use technologies uh, to concentrate the streams and then put them through um, a further uh, processes, um, that it's possible to increase the um, recovery efficiency. So that, that's what it's demonstrating here. So we have ion exchange, air sorption, pressure driven membrane separation. So what it is, is we, will, we, should, we would be seeing some of, uh, for, for example, in membrane separation, we should be seeing a, a stream that is concentrated with ammonia. And therefore, that could be submitted to a chemical precipitation or stripping or some sort of recovery process to be able to enhance recovery. So, um, of course, uh, last you see that microalgae-based treatment where you can either direct it towards energy recovery through bio-oils or um, valuable bioproducts, you can uh, get those uh, proteins of higher value. Um, the experience that it will be based on, you know, what is more profitable for any scenario. And of course, the directory use is possible. Um, for phosphorus, there are many opportunities as well. Um, biological treatment followed by chemical precipitation and to until further application use. Uh, what is shown here on this um, um, diagram is that there is unplanned recovery going on here. It's, they're doing what they want to do in, in, above, and then below is the planned recovery. So semi-planned recovery is through the uh, uh, presentation technologies. So um, it, this is showing uh, how much of the um, energy is required or what would be the carbon footprint for this option, these two options here. And um, here we're talking about uh, sequential batch reactor and then membrane um, the reactors um, and going through sequences and then uh, recovering through other processes. So again, you'll see um, that that's the second option we have in a combining um, biological processes. And here again, we'd look at anaerobic processes combined with membrane bioreactor design um, that would produce methane as well. And so phosphorus and methane being um, produced simultaneously. Uh, and of course, also shows the. Um, finally, we also, there is other option, electrochemical treatment option. It looks like a little cleaner, but uh, because it also produces hydrogen. But then, you know, uh, um, we need to look at so how which one is the best. Like you know, when we have so many options, sometimes we get confused. What is best? So here we note that for each of the five different options, semi-planned and unplanned and electrochemical uh, or biological process membrane recovery combined with methane or hydrogen uh, recovery process, you see that recovery proportion for, for a membrane-based technology seems to be higher. Uh, but you will also see when there is electrical electricity consumption, um, um, greenhouse gas emissions are higher and energy consumption is higher as well, especially with the anaerobic membrane bioreactor. Um, this depends on how much it has recovered, how um, and in what quantity and quality it has been recovered, and and then um, uh, and so obviously your cost will be affected by the by the product that you are producing there. Byproduct recovery, in addition to all of this, we talked about it's possible to get bioplastics and and uh, other uh, acids and bases or products that can be uh, recovered from um, um, from um, the treatment op operations. So for example, you see here bioelectrochemical systems. Um, they, they, they're very helpful, but they have to, there's more work that needs to be done to, to bring them forward and so on. Um, I think we'll keep moving. Uh, so what is, uh, it's all exciting, right? So what is, what is stopping us from doing, going further? So as we all know, uh, the technological limitations are always there. Um, and that means that we'll translate into economics, right? So costs uh, versus benefit scenarios. Of course, if it, and then emissions and health risks um, associated with the products that we're getting out of the processes and the quality and the quantity that is produced. And management, how we are, so producing at every wastewater treatment plant is probably not a good idea because we need to look for market potential for it. 
and and if it is com uh, if it if it is competitive, right? Uh, and so you'll see the distribution and transport. Where do we have our customers or stakeholders that will be interested in this kind of products, and how much quantities we're able to supply, uh, and so on. And of course, finally, regulatory and the policy um, uh, aspects that need to be considered, market value propositions. And most importantly, a lot of these products go into our communities, going back into industries and eventually end up in communities. And so social acceptance is very important. What our public is willing to accept and invest in because they are the final investors in everything we do. Again, this one shows uh, um, positives and negatives for each of these options, for water recovery, reuse, energy recovery, and nutrients. Um, so when it comes to energy, good thing is uh, there is a lot of push from government, uh, federal agencies across the world. So, and of course, water too. Uh, we need those incentives and subsidies to be able to make it attractive initially while we try to develop uh, more efficient and productive technologies, right? So because we can't just jump in with the best solution. Um, but there is, it usually takes time for research and development to advance so that we're able to provide the best sol solution. While it takes time, I think we need support from the government agencies and communities so that we're able to implement what we have and benefit from it and so on. And so that, that's one thing we need to look, look at. Um, finally, this is an example of one of the utilities in, in New York trying to deal with their uh, energy and biosolids and um, uh, issues, management issues on their side. So what I liked about it is they're trying to consider everything that's out there. So it's just always good to consider what is out there that is uh, beneficial and proven in terms of you know the uh, processes. Um, so I see that they're trying to look for solar in implementation and then anaerobic digestion for biogas. And then of course, they're looking at energy efficiency, conservation measures, and of course, uh, looking at the final products, byproducts that could be of uh, value. So I want to just say two things. Um, it is clear that when we think about um, advancing circular economy in water resources recovery facilities, uh, they demand resources initially to be able to uh, proceed, but they can be justified and they, they should be justified always from a sustainability point of view. And secondly, we always need to be working in integrated framework. So for example, water and wastewater, not they're not two things, they are actually one thing. We in global cycle or even regional cycle, just the, we all we are all talking about one water. It's not this, even though it is present in different forms, storm water, sea water, you know. Uh, groundwater, but it, it so when we put different uh, utilities together and work with industries, uh, uh, solutions seem to be more innovative and smarter. And of course, in concert with what's available there, what is already proven to be beneficial and efficient, uh, uh, we work with us. Uh, I with this, I'll end my talk, and we'll be happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nanaswar. Uh, very informative presentation. I loved how you tied in the circular, this term of circular economy and what does that mean and that circular resource recovery. So thank you very much. And thank you, Sean, for your overview of all of these different technologies. Um, we do have some questions here and then I'll let a few people unmute um, to ask their questions as well. Um, so there's a question in the Q&A box that says, what about harvesting Daphnia, have you heard of that or can address that at all? Like Daphnia flies? Is that... So we're talking about algal species? Not sure, there's just an open question and I will actually let Randy yeah. speak here and ask that question. So Randy, you are uh, available to speak. You can unmute if you'd like to ask your questions uh, for our speakers. Hi, Randy, can you hear us? I see you've unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah, so it, it it sounds like it's one of the 
algal species. Um, I, I, um, okay, as far as I can connect it with, with my knowledge. Yes, I mean, algal technologies, we could do that. Um, there are a number of options for that. Uh, Randy, please go ahead and clarify. I don't think we can hear Randy. Randy, if you want to put something in the chat here. Uh, oh, Daphne is not algae, completely different organisms. Um, ben, would you be willing to chat on that topic really quickly? If you uh, just let me know in the chat and I can give you permission to speak. All right. Ben Shackman, uh, I am giving you permission to speak. So please feel free to unmute. Thanks for, uh, please introduce yourself by the way, Ben. <laughs> Oh, sure, Cassie. Thank you so much. Uh, ben Shackman, I'm the Midwest Regional Manager, Triple Point Environmental. Uh, we're, a, we're a company that's focused on lagoon systems, so the very small end of the industry. Daphne is a wonderful organism. Uh, it, it's also known as a water flea, and they're great as an indicator organism. But in looking at how uh, some of the algal reclamation is done, it doesn't appear as though uh, there'd be a great benefit to trying to harvest Daphne. Um, as, as well. Uh, Daphne is a, a neat little indicator organism to have in, in your system. Uh, it's a great indicator. You can watch them turn pink and, and sort of red if the if the community as a whole is stressed by predation or, or low DO. But yeah, I don't know that they're a great a great option. Uh, what's going on with algae looks like really the the winning technology as far as how to how to use microorganisms to pull uh, nutrients out of water and then reclaim and repurpose. Uh, Cassie, I hope that answered the the uh, original poster's questions. Awesome. Yes, I believe it did. Thank you so much, Ben, for hopping in. Um, we appreciate oh, your welcome. expertise. We've got, as you can see, we've got such a great uh, crew of people that attend these webinars that have expertise as well. So thank you, Ben. I will say in all the research I did into harvesting technologies and various resource reuses, I did not run across Daphne as one of the harvestable side streams. I agree with, with you. Um, uh, ben, thank you for that clarification. At least it's a microbial species we're talking about. It's not something else. So uh, there is definitely a way of looking into microalgae and uh, Daphne a synergy, probably that could lead to uh, potential removal or harvesting of Daphne. I would think. So like we would look into uh, microalgae and bacteria synergy in wastewater treatment systems. You muted, Cassie. Thank you so much. Um, did we have another question. Do you know how, how pyrolysis compares to the use of granulated active carbon treatment for PFAS removal? So that again, Pyrolysis compares to the use of granulated activated carbon treatment for PFAS removal. Yeah, so uh, granulated activated carbon um, is actually absorbing that PFAS into the material, and then it's wasted as a waste product, uh, where pyrolysis is taking the actual sludge with the PFAS in it, heats it up, breaks that PFAS down into non-harmful chemicals, gases, water, um, and so it takes a bit more energy, um, but it can actually treat granulated activated carbon itself and, and return it to a usable form. Um, so uh, there are a little bit different types of technologies there. Yeah, if I can, if I may add. So mm -hmm. uh, with the granular activated carbon systems or methods we have, there is a clear limitation with what they can do. Uh, short chain PFAS are actually escaping. They're not being adsorbed onto uh, the GAC material. So in terms of uh, efficiency, uh, pyrolysis uh, or hydro hydrothermal treatment or supercritical oxidation, uh, those are being viewed as more efficient, but if we know that there are some drawbacks with that because of the high temperatures and pressures we have to work with. Although uh, presently GAC is the one that considered is to be uh, affordable, and uh, even though it is going to um, have le less efficiency, it is suitable for large scale, a uh, large, um, um, large, like I said, uh, large chain molecular um, PFAS. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. Um, Deshaun um, is one of our uh, pan or our uh, attendees today, and he had raised his he or she had raised his hand at some point. Um, so I just wanted to give you a chance. Deshaun, if you want to unmute and ask your question of our panelists, please feel free to do so now. Um, while we are waiting to see if Deshaun um, wants to ask the questions, uh, I know there's another question in the chat about Daphnia, so uh, I will definitely let Ben um, place that input in the chat. And are there any other questions from our panel or our uh, attendees today? I'm not seeing any more. Sean, have you seen any questions come in? I have not. Okay. Scroll back through. Let me see. Okay. Deshaun, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question, please feel free to go ahead. I guess that attendee does not want to answer this question live and that's fine. Um, so we will just wrap up today's session. So thank you so much to everybody who was in attendance today. Thank you, Sean, as always, for a great overview and presentation. Uh, Nanaswar, thank you so much for joining us today and bringing your expertise to the table. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists or would like to connect with them further, um, please let us know. We'd be happy to make connections uh, to any of our speakers today. Again, um, you will receive your certificates and CEUs uh, tomorrow. So please look out for your in your inbox for those. And as always, thank you so much for joining the Illinois EPA Office of Energy Public Water Infrastructure webinars. So our next webinar will be on low to no cost energy efficiency measures for new treatment systems. So join us on uh, November 9th at 11 a.m. Uh, for that session. We'll send out a reminder so you can get registered, but we hope to see you there. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Take care. A little plug for that next webinar too. We're looking oh. for operator input. So if you've made a little tweak at your plant that made a big change in your energy consumption or your process efficiency, let us know. We want to have you present a little bit and talk about it. Awesome. Good plug, Sean. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. you all.